Section 1 of The Natural History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 1, by Pliny the Elder, translated by John Bostick and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 1. Preface. The only translation of Pliny's Natural History, which has hitherto appeared in the English language, is that by Philemon Holland, published in the latter part of the reign of Elizabeth. It is no disparagement to Holland's merits, as a diligent and generally faithful translator, to say that his work is unsuited to the requirements of the nineteenth century. In the present translation, the principal editions of Pliny have been carefully consulted, and no pains have been spared as a reference to the notes will show, to present to the reader the labors of recent commentators, among whom stands preeminent the celebrated Cuvier. It has been a primary object to bring to the illustration of the work whatever was afforded by the progress of knowledge and modern discoveries in science and art. Without ample illustration, Pliny's valuable work would want much of the interest which belongs to it, and present difficulties scarcely surmountable to any one who has not made the author his especial study. In the first two books, the text of Hardouin, as given in Lemar's edition, Paris, 1827, has been followed. In the remainder, that of Sillig, 1851-53, excepting in some instances where, for reasons given in the notes, it has been deemed advisable to depart from it. The first two books and portions of others are the performance of the late Dr. Bostock, who contemplated a translation of the entire work. But, unfortunately for the interest of science, he was not permitted to carry his design into execution. Upwards of a hundred pages had been printed off before the present translator entered on his duties, and as they had not the advantage of Dr. Bostock's superintendence through the press, some trifling oversights have occurred. These are, for the most part, corrected in a short appendix. The Life and Writings of Pliny Gaius Plinius Secundus was born either at Verona or Novum Comum, now Como, in Cisalpine Gaul, in the year AUC 776 and AD 23. It is supposed that his earlier years were spent in his native province, and that he was still a youth when he removed to Rome to attend the lectures of the grammarian Appion. It was in about his sixteenth year that he there saw Lolia Paulina, and in the following she was divorced by Caligula, and it was probably in his twentieth that he witnessed the capture of a large fish at Ostia by Claudius and his attendants, and in his twenty-second that he visited Africa, Egypt, and Greece. In his twenty-third year Pliny served in Germany under the legatus Pomponius Secundus, whose friendship he soon acquired and, in consequence, promoted to the command of an ala, or troop of cavalry. During his military career, he wrote a treatise, now lost, on the use of the javelin by cavalry, and traveled over that country as far as the shores of the German Ocean, besides visiting Belgic Gaul. In his twenty-ninth year, he returned to Rome, and applied himself for a time to forensic pursuits, which, however, he appears soon to have abandoned. About this time he wrote the life of his friend Pomponius, and an account of the wars in Germany, in twenty books, neither of which are extant. Though employed in writing a continuation of the Roman history of Alphidius Bassus, from the time of Tiberius, he judiciously suspended its publication during the reign of Nero, who appointed him his procurator in Nero Spain, and not improbably honored him with equestrian rank. It was during his sojourn in Spain that the death of his brother-in-law, Gaius Caecilius, left his nephew, Gaius Plinius Caecilius Secundus, the author of the letters, an orphan, whom, immediately upon his return to Rome, A.D. 70, he adopted, receiving him and his widowed mother under his roof. Having been previously known to Vespasian in the German wars, he was admitted into the number of his most intimate friends, and obtained an appointment at court the nature of which is not known, but Rezonico conjectures that it was in connection with the imperial treasury. Though Pliny was on intimate terms also with Titus, 
to whom he dedicated his natural history, there was little ground for the assertion, sometimes made, that he served under him in the Jewish wars. His account of Palestine clearly shows that he had never visited that country. It was at this period that he published his continuation of the history of Alphidius Bassus. From the titles which he gives to Titus in the dedicatory preface, it is pretty clear that his natural history was published A.D. 77, two years before his death. In A.D. 73 or 74, he had been appointed by Vespasian, prefect of the Roman fleet at Misenum, on the western coast of Italy. It was to this elevation that he owed his romantic death, somewhat similar, it has been remarked, to that of Empedocles, who perished in the crater of Mount Etna. The closing scene of his active life, simultaneously with the destruction of Heraclineum and Pompeii, cannot be better described than in the language employed by his nephew in an epistle to his friend Tacitus, the historian. My uncle was at Mycenae, where he was in personal command of the fleet. On the ninth day before the calends of September, at about the seventh hour, 1 p.m., my mother, observing the appearance of a cloud of unusual size and shape, mentioned it to him. After reclining in the sun, he had taken his cold bath. He had then again lain down, and after a short repast, applied himself to his studies. Immediately upon hearing this, he called for his shoes, and ascended a spot, from which he could more easily observe this remarkable phenomena. The cloud was to be seen gradually rising upwards, though, from the great distance, it was uncertain from which of the mountains it arose. It was afterwards, however, a certain to be Vesuvius. In appearance and shape it strongly resembled a tree. Perhaps it was more like a pine than anything else, with a stem of enormous length, reaching upwards to the heavens, and then spreading out in a number of branches in every direction. I have little doubt that either it had been carried upwards by a violent gust of wind, and that the wind dying away it had lost its compactness, or else that, being overcome by its own weight, it had decreased in density, and became extended over a large surface. At one moment it was white, at another dingy and spotted, just as it was more or less charged with earth or with ashes. To a man so eager as he was in the pursuit of knowledge, this appeared to be a most singular phenomenon, and one that deserves to be viewed more closely. Accordingly, he gave orders that a light Liburnian vessel to be got ready, and left it at my option to accompany him. To this, however, I made answer, that I should prefer continuing my studies, and, as it so happened, he himself had just given me something to write. Taking his tablets with him, he left the house. The sailors stationed at Retina, alarmed at the imminence of the danger, for the village lay at the foot of the mountain, and the sole escape was by sea, sent to entreat his assistance in rescuing them from this frightful peril. Upon this, he instantly changed his plans, and what he had already begun from a desire for knowledge, he determined to carry out as a matter of duty. He had the galleys put to sea at once, and went on board himself, with the intention of rendering assistance, not only to Retina, but to many other places as well, for the whole of this charming coast was thickly populated. Accordingly, he made all possible haste towards the spot, from which others were flying, and steered straight onwards into the very midst of the danger. So far indeed was he from every sensation of fear, that he remarked, and had noted down, every movement and every change that was to be observed in the appearance of this ominous eruption. The ashes were now falling fast upon the vessels, hotter and more thickly the nearer they approached the shore. Showers of pumice, too, intermingled with black stones, calcined and broken by the action of the flames. The sea suddenly retreated from the shore, where the debris of the mountain rendered landing quite impossible. After hesitating for a moment whether or not to turn back, upon the pilot strongly advising him to do so, Fortune favors the bold, said he, conduct me to Pomponianus. Pomponianus was then at Stabai, a place that lie on the other side of the bay, for in those parts the shores were winding, and as they gradually trend away, the sea forms a number of little creeks. At this spot the danger at present was not imminent, but still it could be seen, and it appeared to be approaching nearer and nearer. 
Pomponianus had ordered his baggage on board the ships, determined to take the flight, if the wind, which happened to be blowing the other way, should chance the lull. The wind, being in this quarter, was extremely favorable to his passage, and my uncle soon arrived at Stabai, embraced his anxious friend, and did his best to restore his courage, and the better to reassure him by evidence of his own senses of their safety. He requested the servants to conduct him to the bath. After bathing, he took his place at table and dined, and that too in high spirits, or at all events, what equally shows his strength of mind, with every outward appearance of being so. In the meantime, vast sheets of flame and large bodies of fire were to be seen arising from Mount Vesuvius. The glare and brilliancy of which were beheld in bolder reliefs as the shades of night came on apace. My uncle, however, in order to calm their fears, persisted in saying that this was only the light given by some villages which had been abandoned by the rustics in their alarm to the flames, after which he retired to rest, and soon fell fast asleep. For his respiration, which with him was heavy and loud, in consequence of his corpulence, was distinctly heard by the servants who were keeping watch at the door of the apartment. The courtyard which led to his apartment had now become filled with cinders and pumice stones, to such a degree that if he remained any longer in the room, it would have been quite impossible for him to leave it. On being awoke, he immediately arose, and rejoined Pomponianus, and the others, who had, in the meanwhile, been sitting up. They then consulted together whether it would be better to remain in the house, or take their chance in the open air, as the buildings was now rocking to and fro with the violence and repeated shocks, while the walls, as though rooted up from their very foundations, seemed to be at one moment carried in this direction, and another in that. Having adopted the latter alternative, they were now alarmed at the showers of light calcined pumice stones that were falling thick about them, a risk, however, to which, as a choice of evils, they had to submit. In taking this step, I must remark that, while with my uncle it was reason triumphing over reason, with the rest it was only one fear getting the better of the other. Taking the precaution of placing pillows on their heads, they tied them on with towels, by way of protection against the falling stones and ashes. It was by now day in other places, though there it was still night, more dark and more profound than any ordinary night. Torches, however, and various lights and some, measure served to dispel the gloom. It was then determined to make for the shore, and to ascertain whether the sea would now admit of their embarking. It was found, however, to be still too stormy and too boisterous to allow of their making the attempt. Upon this my uncle lay down on a sail which had been spread for him, and more than once asked for some cold water which he drank. Very soon, however, they were alarmed by the flames and the sulphurous smell which announced their approach upon which the others at once took to flight, while my uncle arose, leaning upon two of the servants for support. Upon making this effort, he instantly fell to the ground, the dense vapor having, I imagine, stopped the respiration and suffocated him, for his chest was naturally weak and contracted, and often troubled with violent palpitations. When day was at last restored, the third after the closing one of his existence, his body was found untouched and without a wound. There was no change to be perceived in the clothes, and its appearance was rather that of a person asleep than of a corpse. In the meantime, my mother and myself were at Mycenaeum. That, however, has nothing to do with the story, as it was only your wish to know the details connected with his death. I shall therefore draw to a conclusion. The only thing that I shall add is the assurance that I have truthfully related all these facts, of which I was either an eyewitness myself, or heard them at the time of their occurrence, a period when they were most likely to be correctly related. You, of course, will select such points as you may think the most important, for it is one thing to write a letter, another to write a history, one thing to write for a friend, another to write for the public. Farewell. End of section one. Section two of the Natural History, Volume one. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Natural History, Volume 1, by Pliny the Elder. Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley. Section 2. The Life and Writings of Pliny. Part 2. Of the mode of life pursued by Pliny, and of the rest of his works, an equally interesting account has been preserved by his nephew, in an epistle addressed to Macer. We cannot more appropriately conclude than by presenting this epistle to the reader. I am highly gratified to find that you read the works of my uncle with such a degree of attention as to feel a desire to possess them all, and that with this view you inquire, what are their names? I will perform the duties of an index, then, and not content with that, will state in what order they were written. For even that is a kind of information which is by no means undesirable to those who are devoted to literary pursuits. His first composition was a treatise on the use of the javelin by cavalry in one book. This he composed with equal diligence and ingenuity when he was in command of a troop of horse. His second work was The Life of Quintus Pomponius Secundus, in two books, a person by whom he had been particularly beloved. These books he composed as a tribute, which was justly due to the memory of his deceased friend. His next work was Twenty Books on the Wars in Germany, in which he has compiled an account of all the wars in which we have been engaged with the people of that country. This he had begun while serving in Germany having been recommended to do so in a dream. For in his sleep he thought that the figure of Drusus Nero stood before him, the same Drusus, who, after the most extensive conquest in that country, there met his death. Commending his memory to Pliny's attentive care, Drusus conjured him to rescue it from the decaying effect of oblivion. Next to these came his three books, entitled The Student, divided, on account of their great size, into six volumes. In these he has given instructions for the training of the orator, from the cradle to his entrance on public life. In the latter years of Nero's reign, he wrote eight books on difficulties in the Latin language, that being a period at which every kind of study, in any way free-spoken or of even elevated style, would have been rendered dangerous by the tyranny that was exercised. His next work, was his continuation of the history of Aufidius Bassus in thirty-one books, after which came his natural history in thirty-seven books, a work remarkable for its comprehensiveness and erudition, and not less varied than nature herself. You will wonder how a man so occupied with business could possibly find time to write such a number of volumes, many of them on subjects of a nature so difficult to be treated of. You will be even more astonished when you learn that, for some time he pleaded at the bar as an advocate, that he was only in his fifty-sixth year at the time of his death, and that the time that intervened was equally trenched upon and frittered away by the most weighty duties of business, and the marks of favor shown him by princes. His genius, however, was truly quite incredible, his zeal indefatigable, and his power of application wonderful in the extreme. At the festival of the Vulcanalia, he began to set up at a late hour by candlelight, not for the purpose of consulting the stars, but with the object of pursuing his studies, while in the winter he would set to work at the seventh hour of the night, or the eighth at the very latest, often indeed at the sixth. By nature he had the faculty of being able to fall asleep in a moment. Indeed, slumber would sometimes overtake him in his studies, and then leave him just as suddenly. Before daybreak he was in the habit of attending the Emperor Vespasian, for he too was one who made an excellent use of his nights, and then betook himself to the duties with which he was charged. On his return home he devoted all the time which was remaining to study. Taking an early repast, after the old fashion, light and easy of digestion, in the summer time, if he had any leisure to spare, he would lie down in the sunshine while some book was read to him he himself making notes and extracts in the meanwhile. For it was his habit never to read anything without making extracts, it being the maxim of him that, that there is no book so bad, but that some good may be got out of it. After thus enjoying the sunshine, he generally took a cold bath, after which he would sit down to a slight repast, and then take a short nap. On awaking, 
as though another day had now commenced, he would study till the hour of the evening meal, during which some book was generally read to him, he making comments on it in a cursory manner. I remember, on one occasion, a friend of his interrupting the reader, who had given the wrong pronunciation to some words, and making him go over them again. "'You understood him, didn't you?' said my uncle. "'Yes,' said the other. "'Why, then, did you make him go over it again? "'Through this interruption of yours we have lost more than ten lines.' So thrifty a manager was he of time. In summer he rose from the evening meal by daylight, and in winter, during the first hour of the night, just as though there had been some law which made it compulsory on him to do so. This is how he lived in the midst of his employments, and the bustle of the city. When, in retirement in the country, the time spent in the bath was the only portion that was not allotted by him to study. When I say, in the bath, I mean while he was in the water, for while his body was being scraped with a striggle and rubbed, he either had some book read to him, or else would dictate himself. While upon a journey, as though relieved from every other care, he devoted himself to study, and nothing else. By his side was his secretary, with a book and tablets, and in the winter time the secretary's hands were protected by gloves, that the severity of the weather might not deprive his master for a single moment of his services. It was for this reason also that, when at Rome, he would never move about except in a litter. I remember that on one occasion he found fault with me for walking. You might have avoided losing all those hours, said he, for he looked upon every moment as lost that was not devoted to study. It was by means of such unremitting industry as this that he completed so many works, and left me one hundred and sixty volumes of notes, written extremely small on both sides, which, in fact, renders the collection doubly voluminous. He himself used to relate that when he was the procurator in Spain, he might have parted with his commonplace book to Ligarius Licinius for four hundred thousand sesterces, and at that time the collection was not so extensive as afterwards. When you come to think of how much he must have read, of how much he has written, would you not really suppose that he had never been engaged in business, and had never enjoyed the favor of princes? And yet, on the other hand, when you hear what labor he expended upon his studies, does it not almost seem that he has neither written nor read enough? For, in fact, what pursuits are those that would not have been interrupted by occupations such as his? While, again, what is there that such unremitting perseverance as his could not have effected? I am in the habit, therefore, of laughing at it when people call me a studious man, me, who, in comparison with him, am a downright idler, and yet I devote to study as much time as my public engagements on the one hand, and my duty to my friends on the other will admit of. Who is there, then, out of all those who have devoted their whole life to literature, that ought not, when put in comparison with him, to quite blush at a life that would almost appear to have been devoted to slothfulness and inactivity? But my letter has already exceeded its proper limits, for I had originally intended to write only on the subject as to which you had made inquiry, the books of his composition that he left. I trust, however, that these particulars will prove no less pleasing to you than the writings themselves, and that they will not only induce you to peruse them, but excite you, by a feeling of generous emulation, to produce some work of a similar nature. Farewell. Of all the works written by Pliny, only one, the Historia Naturalis, has survived to our times. This work, however, is not a natural history in the modern acceptation of the word, but rather a vast encyclopedia of ancient knowledge and belief upon almost every known subject, not less varied than nature herself, as his nephew says. It comprises, within the compass of thirty-seven books, twenty thousand matters of importance, collected from about two thousand volumes, nearly all of which have now perished. The works, as Pliny himself states, of one hundred writers of authority, together with a vast number of additional matters unknown to those authorities, and many of them the results of his own experience and observation. Harduin has drawn up a catalogue of the authors, quoted by Pliny. They amount in the number to between four hundred and five hundred. 
the following is a brief sketch of the plan of this wonderful monument of human industry after a dedicatory epistle to titus followed by a table of contents of the other books which together form the first book the author proceeds to give an account of the prevailing notions as to the universe the earth the sun the moon the stars and the more remarkable properties of the elements partes naturae he then passes on to a geographical description of the face of the earth as known to the ancients after the geography comes what might in strict propriety be termed natural history including a history of man replete indeed with marvels but interesting in the highest degree having mentioned at considerable length the land animals fishes birds and insects he passes on to botany which in its various aspects occupies the larger portion of the work at the same time in accordance with this comprehensive plan this part includes a vast amount of information on numerous subjects the culture of the cereals and the manufacture of oil wine and paper and numerous other articles of daily use after treating at considerable length of medical botany he proceeds to speak of medicaments derived from the human body from which he branches off into discussions on the history of medicine and magic which last he looks upon as an offshoot from the medical art and he takes this opportunity of touching upon many of the then current superstitions and notions on astrology he concludes this portion of his work with an account of the medicinal properties of the various waters and those of fishes and other aquatic animals he then presents us with a treatise on mineralogy in which he has accumulated every possible kind of information relative to the use of gold silver bronze and other metals a subject which not unnaturally leads him into repeated digressions relative to money jewels plate statues and statuaries mineral pigment next occupies his attention with many interesting notices on the great painters of greece from which he passes on to the various kinds of stone and materials employed in building and the use of marble for the purposes of sculpture including a notice of that art and the most eminent sculptors the last book is devoted to an account of gems and precious stones and concludes with a eulogium on his native country as alike distinguished for its fertility its picturesque beauties and the natural endowments and high destinies of its people from the writings of pliny we gather of course a large amount of information as to his opinions and the constitution of his mind his credulity it must be admitted is great in the extreme though singularly enough he severely taxes the greeks with the same failing were we not assured from other sources that he was eminently successful in life was in the enjoyment of opulence and honored with the favor and confidence of princes the remarks which he frequently makes on human life in the seventh book more especially would have led us to the conclusion that he was a disappointed man embittered against his fellow creatures and dissatisfied with the terms on which the tenor of life is granted to us he opens that book with a preface replete with querulous dissatisfaction and repinings at the lot of man the only tearful animal he says he repines at the helpless and wretched condition of the infant at the moment it is ushered into life and the numerous pains and vices to which it is doomed to be subject man's liability to disease is with him a blemish in the economy of nature life he says this gift of nature however long it may be is but too uncertain and too frail to those even to whom it is most largely granted it is dealt out with a sparing and niggardly hand if we only think of eternity as we cannot have life on our own terms he does not think it worthy of our acceptance and more than once expresses his opinion that the sooner we are rid of it the better sudden death he looks upon as a remarkable phenomenon but at the same time as the greatest blessing that can be granted to us and when he mentions cases of resuscitation it is only to indulge in the querulous complaint that exposed as he is by his birth to the caprices of fortune man can be certain of nothing no not even of his own death though anything but an epicurean in the modern acceptation of the word he seems to have held some at least of the tenets of epicurus in reference to the immortality of the soul whether he supposed that the soul at the moment of death is resolved into its previous atoms or constituent elements 
he does not inform us. But he states it as his belief that after death the soul has no more existence than it had before birth, that all notions of immortality are a mere delusion, and that the very idea of a future existence is ridiculous and spoils the greatest blessings of nature, death. He certainly speaks of ghosts or apparitions seen after death, but these he probably looked upon as exceptional cases, if indeed he believed in the stories which he quotes, of which we have no proofs, or rather indeed presumptive proofs to the contrary, for some of them he calls Magua Fabulotas, most fabulous tales. In relation to human inventions, it is worthy of remark that he states that the first thing in which mankind agreed was the use of the Ionian alphabet, the second the practice of shaving the beard, and the employment of barbers, and the third the division of time into hours. We cannot more appropriately conclude this review of the life and works of Pliny than by quoting the opinions of two of the most eminent philosophers of modern times, Buffon and Cuvier, though the former, it must be admitted, has spoken of him in somewhat too high terms of commendation, and, instituting a comparison between Pliny's works and those of Aristotle, has placed in juxtaposition the names of two men who, beyond an ardent thirst for knowledge, had no characteristics in common. Pliny, says Buffon, has worked upon a plan which is much more extensive than that of Aristotle, and not improbably too extensive. He has made it his object to embrace every subject. Indeed, he would appear to have taken the measure of nature, and to have found her too contracted for his expansive genius. His natural history, independently of that of animals, plants, and minerals, includes an account of the heavens and the earth, of medicine, commerce, navigation, the liberal and mechanical arts, the origin of usages and customs, in a word, the history of all the natural sciences and all the arts of human invention. What, too, is still more astonishing, in each of these departments Pliny shows himself equally great. The grandeur of his ideas and the dignity of his style confer an additional luster on the profoundness of his erudition. Not only did he know all that was known in his time, but he was also gifted with that comprehensiveness of view which in some measure multiplies knowledge. He had all that delicacy of perception, upon which depends so materially upon elegance and taste, and he communicates to his readers that freedom of thought and that boldness of sentiment which constitutes the true germ of philosophy. His work, as varied as nature herself, always paints her in the most attractive colors. It is, so to say, a compilation from all that had been written before his time, a record of all that was good or useful. But this record has in it features so grand, this compilation contains matter grouped in a manner so novel, that it is preferable to most of the original works that treat upon similar subjects. The judgment pronounced by Cuvier on Pliny's work, though somewhat less highly colored, awards to it a high rank among the most valuable productions of antiquity. The work of Pliny, says he, is one of the most precious monuments that have come down to us from ancient times, and affords proof of an astonishing amount of erudition in one who is a warrior and a statesman. To appreciate with justice this vast and celebrated composition, it is necessary to regard it in several points of view, with reference to the plan proposed, the facts stated, and the style employed. The plan proposed by the writer is of immense extent. It is his object to write not merely a natural history in our restricted sense of the term, not merely an account, more or less detailed, of animals, plants, and minerals, but a work which embraces astronomy, physics, geography, agriculture, commerce, medicine, and the fine arts, and all these in addition to natural history, properly so called while at the same time he continually interweaves with his narrative information upon the arts which bear relation to man, considered metaphysically, and the history of nations, so much so indeed that in many respects this work was the encyclopedia of its age. It is impossible in running over, however cursily, such a prodigious number of subjects that the writer should not have made us acquainted with a multitude of facts, which, while remarkable in themselves, are the more precious from the circumstance that, at the present day, he is the only author extant who relates them. 
It has to be regretted, however, that the manner in which he has collected and grouped this mass of matter has caused it to lose some portion of its value, from his mixture of fable with truth, and more especially from the difficulty, and in some cases the impossibility, of discovering exactly of what object he is speaking. But if Pliny possesses little merit as a critic, it is far otherwise with his talent as a writer, and the immense treasury which he opens to us of Latin terms and forms of expression, these from the very abundance of the subjects upon which he treats, renders his work one of the richest repositories of the Roman language. Wherever he finds it possible to give expression to general ideas or to philosophical views, his language assumes considerable energy and vivacity, and his thoughts present to us a certain novelty and boldness, which tend, in a very great degree, to relieve the dryness of his enumerations, and with the majority of his readers, excuse the insufficiency of his scientific eudications. He is always noble and serious, full of the love of justice and virtue, detestation of cruelty and baseness, of which he had such frightful instances before his eyes, in contempt for that unbridled luxury which in his time had so deeply corrupted the Roman people. For these great merits Pliny cannot be too highly praised, and despite the faults which we are obliged to admit in him when viewed as a naturalist, we are bound to regard him as the most meritorious of the Roman writers, and among these most worthy to be reckoned in the number of the classics who wrote after the reign of Augustus. End of section 2section three of the natural history volume one this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit LibriVox.org. the natural history volume one by pliny the elder translated by john bostock and henry thomas riley section three book one dedication Gaius Plinius Secundus to his friend Titus Vespasian. This treatise on natural history, a novel work in Roman literature which I have just completed, I have taken the liberty to dedicate to you, most gracious emperor, an appellation particularly suitable to you, while on account of his age, that of great is more appropriate to your father. For still thou never wouldst quite despise the trifles that I write. If I may be allowed to shelter myself under the example of Catullus, my fellow countryman, a military term which you well understand. For he, as you know, when his napkins had been changed, expressed himself a little harshly from his anxiety to show his friendship for his dear little Veranius and Fabius. At the same time, this my importunity may affect, what you complained of, my not having done in another too forward epistle of mine. It will now put upon record, and let all the world know, with what kindness you exercise the imperial dignity, you who have had the honor of a triumph, and of the censorship, have been six times consul, and have shared in the tribunate. What is still more honorable, whilst you held them in conjunction with your father, you have presided over the equestrian order, and have been the prefect of the praetorians. All this you have done for the service of the Republic, and at the same time have regarded me as a fellow soldier and a messmate. Nor has the extent of your prosperity produced any change in you, except that it has given you the power of doing good to the utmost of your wishes. Whilst all these circumstances increase the veneration which other persons feel for you with respect to myself, they have made me so bold as to wish to become more familiar. You must therefore place this to your own account, and blame yourself first for any fault of this kind that I might commit. But, although I have lain aside my blushes, I have not gained my object, for you still awe me, and keep me at a distance by the majesty of your understanding. In no one does the force of eloquence and of tribunition oratory blaze out more powerfully. With what glowing language do you thunder forth the praises of your father? How dearly do you love your brother? How admirable is your talent for poetry? 
what a fertility of genius do you possess so as to enable you to imitate your brother but who is there that is bold enough to form an estimate on these points if he is to be judged by you and more especially if you are challenged to do so for the case of those who merely publish their works is very different from that of those who expressly dedicate them to you in the former case i might say emperor why do you read these things they are written only for the common people for farmers or mechanics or for those who have nothing else to do why do you trouble yourself with them indeed when i undertook this work i did not expect that you would sit in judgment upon me i considered your situation much too elevated for you to descend to such an office besides we possess the right of openly rejecting the opinion of men of learning marcus tullius himself whose genius is beyond all competition uses this privilege and remarkable as it may appear employs an advocate in his own defence i do not write for very learned people i do not wish my works to be read by manius persius but by junius congus and if lucullus who first introduced the satirical style applied such a remark to himself and if cicero thought proper to borrow it and that more especially in his treatise de republica how much reason have i to do so who have such a judge to defend myself against and by this dedication i have deprived myself of the benefit of challenge for it is a very different thing whether a person has a judge given him by a lot or whether he voluntarily selects one and we always make more preparation for an invited guest than for one that comes in unexpectedly when the candidates for office during the heat of the canvass deposited the fine in the hands of cato that determined opposer of bribery rejoicing as he did in his being rejected for what he considered to be foolish honors they professed to do this out of respect to his integrity the greatest glory which a man could attain it was on this occasion that cicero uttered the noble ejaculation how happy you are marcus porcius of whom no one dares to ask what is dishonorable when lucius scipio asiaticus appealed to the tribunes among whom was gracchus he expressed full confidence that he should obtain an acquittal even from a judge who was his enemy hence it follows that he who appoints his own judge must absolutely submit to the decision this choice is therefore termed an appeal i am well aware that placed as you are in the highest station and gifted with the most splendid eloquence and the most accomplished mind even those who come to pay their respects to you do it in a kind of veneration on this account i ought to be careful that what is dedicated to you should be worthy of you but the country people and indeed some whole nations offer milk to the gods and those who cannot procure frankincense substitute in its place salted cakes for the gods are not dissatisfied when they are worshipped by every one to the best of his ability but my temerity will appear the greater by the consideration that these volumes which i dedicate to you are of such inferior importance for they do not admit of the display of genius nor indeed is my one of the highest order they admit of no excursions nor orations nor discussions nor any wonderful adventures nor any variety of transactions nor from the barrenness of the matter of any thing particularly pleasant in the narration or agreeable to the reader the nature of things and life as it actually exists are described in them and often the lowest department of it so that in very many cases i am obliged to use rude and foreign or even barbarous terms and these often require to be introduced by a kind of preface and besides this my road is not a beaten track nor one which the mind is much disposed to travel over there is no one among us who has ever attempted it nor is there any one individual among the greeks who has treated of all the topics most of us seek for nothing but amusement in our studies while others are fond of subjects that are of excessive subtlety and completely involved in obscurity 
my object is to treat of all those things which the greeks include in the encyclopedia which however are either not generally known or rendered dubious from our ingenious conceits and there are other matters which many writers have given so much in detail that we quite loathe them it is indeed no easy task to give novelty to what is old and authority to what is new brightness to what has become tarnished and light to what is obscure to render what is slighted acceptable and what is doubtful worthy of our confidence to give all to a natural manner and to each its peculiar nature it is sufficiently honourable and glorious to have been willing even to make the attempt although it should prove unsuccessful and indeed i am of the opinion that the studies of those are more especially worthy of our regard who after having overcome all difficulties prefer the useful office of assisting others to the mere gratification of giving pleasure and this is what i have already done in some of my former works i confess it surprises me that titus livius so celebrated an author as he is in one of the books of his history of the city from its origin should begin with this remark i have now obtained a sufficient reputation so that i might put an end to my work did not my restless mind require to be supported by employment certainly he ought to have composed this work not for his own glory but for that of the roman name and of the people who were the conquerors of all other nations it would have been more meritorious to have persevered in his labours from his love of the work than from the gratification which it afforded himself and to have accomplished it not for his own sake but for that of the roman people i have included in thirty-six books twenty thousand topics all worthy of attention for as domitius piso says we ought to make not merely books but valuable collections gained by the perusal of about two thousand volumes of which a few only are in the hands of the studious on account of the obscurity of the subjects procured by the careful perusal of one hundred select authors and to these i have made considerable additions of things which were either not known to my predecessors or which have been lately discovered nor can i doubt but that there still remain many things which i have omitted for i am a mere mortal and one that has many occupations i have therefore been obliged to compose this work at interrupted intervals indeed during the night so that you will find that i have not been idle even during this period the day i devote to you exactly portioning out my sleep to the necessity of my health and contenting myself with this reward that while we are musing on these subjects according to the remark of varro we are adding to the length of our lives for life properly consists in being awake in consideration of these circumstances and these difficulties i dare promise nothing but you have done me the most essential service in permitting me to dedicate my work to you nor does this merely give a sanction to it but it determines its value for things are often conceived to be of great value solely because they are consecrated in temples i have given a full account of all your family your father yourself and your brother in a history of our own times beginning where aufidius bassus concludes you will ask where is it it has been long completed and its accuracy confirmed but i have determined to commit the charge of it to my heirs lest i should have been suspected during my lifetime of having been unduly influenced by ambition by this means i confer an obligation on those who occupy the same ground with myself and also on posterity who i am aware will contend with me as i have done with my predecessors you may judge of my taste from my having inserted in the beginning of my book the names of the authors that i have consulted for i consider it to be courteous and to indicate an ingenious modesty to acknowledge the sources whence we have derived assistance and not to act as most of those have done whom i have examined for i must inform you that in comparing various authors with each other i have discovered that some of the most grave and of the latest writers have transcribed word for word from former works 
without making any acknowledgment, not avowedly rivaling them in the manner of Virgil, or in the candor of Cicero, who in his treatise De Republica professes to coincide in opinion with Plato, and his essay on consolation for his daughter says that he follows Crantor, and in his offices Panicius, volumes which, as you well know, ought not merely to be always in our hands, but to be learnt by heart. For it is indeed the mark of a perverted mind, and a bad disposition, to prefer being caught in a theft to returning what we have borrowed, especially when we have acquired capital by usurious interest. The Greeks were wonderfully happy in their titles. One work they called Sweet as a Honeycomb, another a cornucopiae, so that you might expect to get even a draught of pigeon's milk from it. Then they have their flowers, their muses, magazines, manuals, gardens, pictures, and sketches, all of them titles for which a man might be tempted even to forfeit his bail. But when you enter upon the works, O oh ye gods and goddesses, how full of emptiness! Our duller countrymen have acquired their antiquities, or their examples, or their arts. I think one of the most humorous of them has his nocturnal studies, a term employed by Bibaculus, a name which he richly deserved. Varro, indeed, is not much behind him, when he calls one of his satires a trick and a half, and another turning the tables. Diodorus was the first among the Greeks, who laid aside this trifling manner, and named his history the library. Appian, the grammarian, indeed, he whom Tiberius Caesar called the trumpeter of the world, but would rather seem to be the bell of the town crier, supposed that every one to whom he inscribed any work would thence acquire immortality. I do not regret not having given my work a more fanciful title. That I may not, however, appear to inveigh so completely against the Greeks, I would wish to be considered under the same point of view with those inventors of the arts of painting and sculpture, of whom you will find an account in these volumes, whose works, although they are so perfect that we are never satisfied with admiring them, are inscribed with a temporary title, such as Apelles or Polycletus was doing this, implying that the work was only commenced and still imperfect, and that the artist might benefit by the criticisms that are made of it and alter any part that required it, if he had not been prevented by death. It is also a great mark of their modesty that they inscribe their works as if they were the last which they had executed, and as still in the hand at the time of their death. I think there are but three works of art which are inscribed positively with an account of the proper place. In these cases it appears that the artist felt the most perfect satisfaction with his own work, and hence these pieces have excited the envy of every one. I indeed freely admit that many may be added to my works, not only to this, but to all which I have published. By this admission I hope to escape from the carping critics, and I have the more reason to say this, because I hear that there are certain Stoics and logicians, and also Epicureans, from the grammarians I expected as much, who are big with something against the little work which I published on grammar, and that they have been carrying these abortions for ten years together, a longer pregnancy this than the elephants. But I well know that even a woman once wrote against Theophrastus, a man so eminent for his eloquence that he obtained his name, which signifies divine speaker, and that from this circumstance originated the proverb of choosing a tree to hang oneself. I cannot refrain from quoting the words of Cato the censor, which are so pertinent to this point. It appears from them that even Cato, who wrote commentaries on military discipline, and who had learned the military art under Africanus, or rather under Hannibal, for he could not endure Africanus, who, when he was his general, had borne away the triumph from him. That Cato, I say, was open to the attacks of such as caught at reputation for themselves by detracting from the merits of others. 
and what does he say in his book? I know that when I shall publish what I have written, there will be many who will do all they can to deprecate it, and, especially, such as are themselves void of all merit. But I let their harangues glide by me. Nor was the remark of Plancus a bad one, when Asinius Polio was said to be preparing an oration against him, which was to be published either by himself or his children after the death of Plancus, in order that he might not be able to answer it. It is only the ghosts that fight with the dead. This gave such a blow to the oration that, in the opinion of the learned, generally, nothing was ever thought more scandalous. Feeling myself, therefore, secure against these vile slanderers, a name elegantly composed by Cato, to express their slanderous and vile disposition, for what other object do they have but to wrangle and breed quarrels? I will proceed with my projected work. And because the public good requires that you should be spared as much as possible from all trouble, I have subjoined to this epistle the contents of each of the following books, and have used my best endeavors to prevent your being obliged to read them all through. And this, which was done for your benefit, will also serve the same purpose for others, so that any one may search for what he wishes, and may know where to find it. This has already been done among us by Valerius Soranus, in his work which he entitled On Mysteries. The first book is the preface of the work, dedicated to Titus Vespasian Caesar. The second is on the world, the elements, and the heavenly bodies. The third, fourth, fifth, and sixth books are on geography, in which is contained an account of the situation of the different countries, the inhabitants, the seas, towns, harbors, mountains, rivers, and dimensions, and various tribes, some of which still exist, and others have disappeared. The seventh is on man, and the inventions of man. The eighth is on the various kinds of land animals. The ninth on aquatic animals. The tenth on the various kinds of birds. The eleventh on insects. The twelfth on odiferous plants. The thirteenth on exotic trees. The fourteenth on vines. The fifteenth on fruit trees the sixteenth on forest trees, the seventeenth on plants raised in nurseries or gardens, the eighteenth on the nature of fruits and the cerealia and the pursuits of the husbandmen, the nineteenth on flax, broom, and gardening, the twentieth on the cultivated plants that are proper for food and for medicine, the twenty-first on flowers and plants that are used for making garlands. The twenty-second on garlands and the medicines made from plants. The twenty-third on medicines made from wine and from cultivated trees. The twenty-fourth on medicines made from forest trees. The twenty-fifth on medicines made from wild plants. The twenty-sixth on new descenses and medicines made for certain diseases from plants the twenty-seventh on some other plants and medicines, the twenty-eighth on medicines procured from man and from large animals, the twenty-ninth on medical authors and on medicines from other animals, the thirtieth on magic and medicines for certain parts of the body, the thirty-first on medicines from aquatic animals, the thirty-second on the other properties of aquatic animals, the thirty-third on gold and silver, the thirty-fourth on copper and lead, and the workers of copper, the thirty-fifth on painting, colors, and painters, the thirty-sixth on marbles and stones, the thirty-seventh on gems. End of section three. Section 4 of The Natural History, Volume 1. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. 
For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Lecter The Natural History, Volume 1, by Pliny the Elder Translated by John Bostock and Henry Thomas Riley Section 4 Book 2 An Account of the World and the Elements Chapter 1 Whether the World Be Finite and Whether There Be More Than One World The world and whatever that be which we otherwise call the heavens, by the vault of which all things are enclosed, we must conceive to be a deity, to be eternal, without bounds, neither created nor subject at any time to destruction. To inquire what is beyond it is no concern of man, nor can the human mind form any conjecture respecting it. It is sacred, eternal, and without bounds, all in all. Indeed, including everything in itself. Finite, yet like what is infinite. The most certain of all things, yet like what is uncertain, externally and internally embracing all things in itself. It is the work of nature, and itself constitutes nature. It is madness to harass the mind, as some have done with attempts to measure the world and to publish these attempts, or like others to argue from what they have made out that there are innumerable other worlds, and that we must believe there to be so many other natures, or that if only one nature produced the whole, there will be so many suns and so many moons, and that each of them will have immense trains of other heavenly bodies. As if the same question would not recur at every step of our inquiry, anxious as we must be to arrive at some termination. Or as if this infinity, which we ascribe to nature, the former of all things, cannot be more easily comprehended by one single formation, especially when that is so extensive. It is madness, perfect madness, to go out of this world and to search for what is beyond it, as if one who is ignorant of his own dimensions could ascertain the measure of anything else, or as if the human mind could see what the world itself cannot contain. CHAPTER Two, OF THE FORM OF THE WORLD that it has the form of a perfect globe we learn from the name which has been uniformly given to it, as well as from numerous natural arguments. For not only does a figure of this kind return everywhere into itself and sustain itself, also including itself, requiring no adjustments, not sensible of either end or beginning in any of its parts, and is best fitted for that motion with which, as will appear hereafter, it is continually turning round, but still more because we perceive it, by the evidence of the sight, to be in every part convex and central, which could not be the case were it of any other figure. CHAPTER three, OF ITS NATURE, WHENCE THE NAME IS DERIVED The rising and the setting of the sun clearly prove that this globe is carried round in the space of twenty-four hours, in an eternal and never-ceasing circuit, and with incredible swiftness. I am not able to say whether the sound caused by the whirling about of so great a mass be excessive, and therefore far beyond what our ears can perceive, nor indeed whether the resounding of so many stars, all carried along at the same time and revolving in their orbits, may not produce a kind of delightful harmony of incredible sweetness. To us who are in the interior, the world appears to glide silently along, both by day and by night. Various circumstances in nature prove to us that there are impressed on the heavens innumerable figures of animals and of all kinds of objects, and that its surface is not perfectly polished like the eggs of birds, as some celebrated authors assert, for we find that the seeds of all bodies fall down from it, principally into the ocean, and being mixed together that a variety of monstrous forms are in this way frequently produced. And indeed this is evident to the eye, for in one part we have the figure of a wain, in another of a bear, 
of a bull and of a letter, while in the middle of them, over our heads, there is a white circle. With respect to the name, I am influenced by the unanimous opinions of all nations, for what the Greeks, from its being ornamented, have termed cosmos, we, from its perfect and complete elegance, have termed mundus. The name Kylum, no doubt, refers to its being engraven, as it were, with the stars, as Varro suggests. In confirmation of this idea we may adduce the zodiac, in which are twelve figures of animals. Through them it is that the sun has continued its course for so many ages. Chapter 4 Of the Elements and the Planets I do not find that any one has doubted that there are four elements. The highest of these is supposed to be fire, and hence proceed the eyes of so many glittering stars. The next is that spirit which both the Greeks and ourselves call by the same name, air. It is by the force of this vital principle, pervading all things and mingling with all, that the earth together with the fourth element, water, is balanced in the middle of space. These are mutually bound together, the lighter being restrained by the heavier, so that they cannot fly off, while on the contrary, from the lighter tending upwards, the heavier are so suspended that they cannot fall down. Thus, by an equal tendency in an opposite direction, each of them remains in its appropriate place, bound together by the never-ceasing revolution of the world, which always turning on itself, the earth falls to the lowest part and is in the middle of the whole, while it remains suspended in the centre, and as it were balancing the centre in which it is suspended, so that it alone remains immovable whilst all things revolve around it, being connected with every other part whilst they all rest upon it. Between this body and the heavens there are suspended in this aerial spirit seven stars, separated by determinate spaces, which on account of their motion we call wandering, although in reality none are less so. The sun is carried along in the midst of these, a body of great size and power, the ruler not only of the seasons and of the different climates, but also of the stars themselves and of the heavens. When we consider his operations, we must regard him as the life or rather the mind of the universe, the chief regulator, and the god of nature. He supplies light to the universe, and dispels all darkness. He both conceals and reveals the other stars. It is he that regulates the seasons, and in the course of nature governs the year as it ever springs in you into birth. It is he that dispels the gloom of the heavens, and sheds his light upon the clouds of the human mind. He too lends his brightness to the other stars. He is most brilliant and most excellent, beholding all things and hearing all things, which I perceive is ascribed to him exclusively by the Prince of Poets, Homer. Chapter 5 Of God I consider it therefore an indication of human weakness to inquire into the figure and form of God. For whatever God be, if there be any other God, and wherever he exists, he is all sense, all sight, all hearing, all life, all mind, and all within himself. To believe that there are a number of gods, derived from the virtues and vices of man, as chastity, concord, understanding, hope, honour, clemency, and fidelity, or according to the opinion of Democritus, that there are only two, punishment and reward, indicates still greater folly. Human nature, weak and frail as it is, mindful of its own infirmity, has made these divisions, so that every one might have recourse to that which he supposed himself to stand more particularly in need of. Hence we find different names employed by different nations. The inferior deities are arranged in classes, and diseases and plagues are deified in consequence of our anxious wish to propitiate them. 
It was from this cause that a temple was dedicated to Fever at the public expense on the Palatine Hill, and to Orbona near the Temple of the Lares, and that an altar was erected to evil fortune on the Esquiline. Hence we may understand how it comes to pass that there is a greater population of the celestials than of human beings, since each individual makes a separate god for himself, adopting his own Juno and his own genius. And there are nations who make gods of certain animals, and even certain obscene things which are not to be spoken of, swearing by stinking meats and such like. To suppose that marriages are contracted between the gods, and that during so long a period there should have been no issue from them, that some of them should be old and always grey-headed, and others young and like children, some of a dark complexion, winged, lame, produced from eggs, living and dying on alternate days, is sufficiently puerile and foolish. But it is the height of impudence to imagine that adultery takes place between them, that they have contests and quarrels, and that there are gods of theft and of various crimes. To assist man is to be a god. This is the path to eternal glory. This is the path which the Roman nobles formerly pursued, and this is the path which is now pursued by the greatest ruler of our age, Vespasian Augustus, he who has come to the relief of an exhausted empire, as well as by his sons. This was the ancient mode of remunerating those who deserved it, to regard them as gods. For the names of all the gods, as well as of the stars that I have mentioned above, have been derived from their services to mankind. And with respect to Jupiter and Mercury, and the rest of the celestial nomenclature, who does not admit that they have reference to certain natural phenomena? But it is ridiculous to suppose that the great head of all things, whatever it be, pays any regard to human affairs. Can we believe, or rather, can there be any doubt, that it is not polluted by such a disagreeable and complicated office? It is not easy to determine which opinion would be most for the advantage of mankind, since we observe some who have no respect for the gods, and others who carry it to a scandalous excess. They are slaves to foreign ceremonies. They carry on their fingers the gods and the monsters whom they worship. They condemn and they lay great stress on certain kinds of food. They impose on themselves dreadful ordinances, not even sleeping quietly. They do not marry or adopt children, or indeed do anything else without the sanction of their sacred rites. There are others, on the contrary, who will cheat in the very capital, and will forswear themselves even by Jupiter Tonans, and while these thrive in their crimes, the others torment themselves with their superstitions to no purpose. Among these discordant opinions mankind have discovered for themselves a kind of intermediate deity but which our conjectures concerning God become more vague still. For all over the world, in all places, and at all times, fortune is the only God whom every one invokes. She alone is spoken of, she alone is accused and is supposed to be guilty. She alone is in our thoughts, is praised and blamed, and is loaded with reproaches. Wavering as she is, conceived by the generality of mankind to be blind, wandering, inconstant, uncertain, variable, and often favouring the unworthy. To her are referred all our losses and all our gains, and in casting up the accounts of mortals she alone balances the two pages of our sheet. We are so much in the power of chance that chance itself is considered as a god, whereby the very existence of a god is shown to be doubtful. But there are others who reject this principle and assign events to the influence of the stars and to the laws of our nativity. They suppose that God, once for all, issues his decrees and never afterwards interferes. This opinion begins to gain ground, and both the learned and the unlearned vulgar are falling into it. Hence we have the admonitions of thunder, the warnings of oracles, the predictions of soothsayers, and things too trifling to be mentioned, as sneezing and stumbling with the feet reckoned among omens. 
The late Emperor Augustus relates that he put the left shoe on the wrong foot the day when he was near being assaulted by his soldiers. And such things as these so embarrass improvident mortals, that among all of them this alone is certain, that there is nothing certain, and that there is nothing more proud or more wretched than man. For other animals have no care but to provide for their subsistence, for which the spontaneous kindness of nature is all-sufficient. And this one circumstance renders their lot more especially preferable, that they never think about glory, or money, or ambition, and above all, that they never reflect on death. The belief, however, that on these points the gods superintend human affairs is useful to us, as well as that the punishment of crimes, although sometimes tardy from the deed to being occupied with such a mass of business, is never entirely remitted, and that a human race was not made the next in rank to himself, in order that they might be degraded like brutes. And indeed this constitutes the great comfort in this imperfect state of man, that even the deity cannot do everything. For he cannot procure death for himself, even if he wished it, which so numerous are the evils of life, has been granted to man as our chief good. Nor can he make mortals immortal, or recall to life those who are dead. Nor can he effect that he who has once lived shall not have lived, or that he who has enjoyed honours shall not have enjoyed them. Nor has he any influence over past events but to cause them to be forgotten. And if we illustrate the nature of our connection with God by a less serious argument, he cannot make twice ten not to be twenty, and many other things of this kind. By these considerations the power of nature is clearly proved, and is shown to be what we call God. It is not foreign to the subject to have digressed into these matters, familiar as they are to every one, from the continual discussions that take place respecting God. End of section 4 Recording by Lecture